In this video, we're going to be taking a look at um, an introduction to the concept of sampling distributions. Uh, first, we'll have a video that goes through the theory behind them and some of the necessary terms and definitions for this section. And then we will have a second video that actually shows a simulation in a program called Fathom looking at uh, sampling distributions. So before we get to the actual concept of sampling distributions themselves, there are some terms and definitions and symbols that we're going to need to review. Some of them are things that we've already talked about. And then there are others that we're going to need to introduce because they will be new concepts. The first review concept is the notion of a population. And remember that a population consists of all the individuals of interest. Also recall that if we have a value that we've computed from population data, for example if we had a, a bunch of uh, individuals in a population and we computed their average age, we would call that value a parameter. So parameters are values that are computed from population data. By contrast, if we don't have population data, because we almost never do, usually it's too costly and too time consuming to get population data. So normally what we work with is sample data. And to review, a sample is a subset of the larger population. Or another way to put that is that it's only some of the individuals of interest. If we were to take a sample of individuals from the larger population and compute the average age for the individuals in the sample, that would be called a statistic. So statistics are values that are computed from sample data. So populations have parameters, samples have statistics. From here on out, we're going to be dealing a lot with um, problems where we might have information about both statistics and parameters in the same problem. And that can get very confusing. You wouldn't want to refer to just the mean because it wouldn't be clear whether you were talking about the mean of the population or the mean of the sample. And so instead of referring to something as simply the mean, for each different measure that we might be interested in, there is a symbol for that measure if it's a statistic versus if it's a parameter. Now if the measure of interest is a mean, if we have the mean of a sample, if we have a sample statistic, we use x bar as the symbol to denote that, and you would actually read that as x bar. That represents the sample mean. If we were dealing with the population parameter of the mean, the, the population mean, it gets the Greek lowercase letter mu. And I do want to say a couple of things about this. This literally is pronounced M-U, it's mu. Um, the same way that like if a, a little baby kitten, you know, mew. Um, the reason I mention that is every now and again I'll have people who call this U, like the lowercase letter U. That's not how you pronounce this, it's pronounced mu, and it's a, a lowercase Greek letter, and it refers to the mean of a population. So it's a population parameter. Now, if we have standard deviation, that's the measure of interest, the standard deviation of a sample gets the lowercase English letter s. The standard deviation of the population gets the lowercase Greek letter sigma that looks sort of like a lowercase r but with a really 
flat top and kind of a puffy backbone there. If we want to talk about the proportion of successes, in the sample, that's P hat, so it's the lowercase letter P with a little hat on it, and you would actually pronounce that P hat. If we're talking about the proportion of successes in the larger population, it's just lowercase p. If we want to talk about proportion of failures, in the sample, that's lowercase q with a hat on it, and in the larger population, it's just lowercase q with no hat. Okay, all of these are summarized uh, in that symbol sheet that you can download, um, along with a lot of other symbols uh, delineating the difference between statistics and parameters. But these are some of the most common ones that we'll be working with throughout the rest of the course. Okay, so just you might want to uh, familiarize yourself with the symbol sheet and review these. Okay, so then the question comes up, why sample? Why is it that we actually engage in this process called sampling? At times, we'd like to know something about the population but because time and resources, usually money, uh, are limited, we can take a sample in the right way to learn about the population. A couple of key phrases here, in the right way. If we want our sample to act like a little miniature population, we need to use one of the valid sampling techniques that we talked about earlier in the course. Uh, if we don't do that, then we have no guarantee or we have no um, probabilistic notion that our sample is going to act like the population in any significant way. But if we've taken our sample in the right way, it works just like a little miniature population and values that we compute from the sample should be pretty close to the true values from the population with a little kind of wiggle room plus or minus factor there. Now when we talk about learning about the population, this is usually referred to as inference. Everything that we have dealt with so far in this course has been either probability, which we've been dealing with for quite some time, or descriptive statistics. We've been describing the shape of a distribution, or we've been summarizing the distribution with a mean and a standard deviation, but we've just been describing an existing distribution. What we're going to be doing from here on out is actually making an inference. Based on the sample data, what can we say is likely about the population? What kind of inferences can we draw? Okay. And there's three main types of inference. that we'll be working with. The first type is called estimation. This is where we make con what are called confidence intervals. But basically in estimation, we estimate the value of a population parameter. And specifically, we're estimating a value. The second main type of inference is called hypothesis testing. And here we formulate a decision.
about a population parameter. And then the last type of inference that we're going to cover in this course is regression. And in regression, we make predictions about the value of a statistical variable. So to give you just a brief example of each type of inference and how it might be used, let's say um, what I was interested in is what is the president's current approval rating? Okay, so obviously I'm not going to poll every single individual in the United States. I'm going to take a representative sample. And then in that sample, I might find what the president's approval rating is just within the sample and then use estimation to estimate what the value of the president's approval rating is in the larger population. Okay, that would be an example of estimation. If I were to take a similar scenario but deal with hypothesis testing where we formulate a decision about a population parameter, I might wonder to myself, has the president's approval rating increased since the State of the Union address? So again, I might take some sample data, I would start with the hypothesis, yes, the president's approval rating has increased since the State of the Union address. And then I would compare that to the data that I'm seeing in the sample to see if the sample data supports the notion of an increase or if it does not support the notion of an increase. So I'm making a decision about a population parameter. This third type regression, we're going to make predictions about the value of a statistical variable. So there I might wonder, what is the president's approval rating likely to be in three months? And so again, I would take some sample data and I would extrapolate that sample data to figure out, okay, what's a likely value in, in three months? What would I expect for the president's approval rating? Okay. So those are the differences between the three types of inference that we're going to be covering for the rest of the course. Now, all of these types of inference are based on the notion of a sampling distribution. To do inference, we need to make use of this sampling distribution concept. So we want to talk about what is a sampling distribution. And then I will um, make, again, a separate video uh, showing you a, a simulation of one. Okay, so what is a sampling distribution? A sampling distribution is a theoretical distribution that tells us about the type of probability distribution that a sample statistic such as X bar or P hat or something like that has. Okay. So far, all of the distributions that we have looked at have been dealing with just the raw data. We've been taking the x values from the sample and graphing them and looking at what is the shape of this distribution. A sampling distribution does something fundamentally different. Instead of looking at raw x values from a single sample, it looks at a collection, for example, of x bars from many different samples all included together. So each sample would have its own x-bar, and we would collect all of those x-bars together and graph them. The important thing to note is that this is a theoretical distribution. Typically, we will not actually be creating these. Um, in practice, that's not what we do. We make use of them in theory, but we do not create them in practice. That being said, if you were to create one, here is how you would do it. So to create a sampling distribution...
And for the sake of argument, let's say we were creating a sampling distribution for x bar for a sample mean. One. Whoops. Collect a simple random sample. And let's say I was collecting random samples of size 30. That's what I'm going to be doing in my simulation that will be in the next video. So collect a simple random sample of 30 individuals. Two. Calculate x bar for this sample. Okay, in the simulation that will be in the next video, the average that I'm calculating is the average age for that sample. So I have a sample of 30 individuals and I calculate the mean age. Step three, repeat steps one and two. So basically I would draw a new sample calculate x bar for that sample. Draw another sample, calculate x bar for that sample. Repeat steps one and two until, whoops, until, all possible samples of size 30 have been generated. This, by the way, is why we don't actually create these in practice. If I were going to do this for a large enough population, I would have to repeat those steps over and over again until I had made all possible samples of size 30 from my larger population. And then four, we plot all of the X bars from steps one, two, and three in a histogram and observe their shape. Okay. But the key difference, the key thing to know about a sampling distribution is it tells us how a sample statistic is distributed, how in this case an X bar is distributed, rather than the raw data values, the raw X's, and it will include X bars from many samples, all taken together on one histogram, rather than X values from just a single sample. Okay, so that's the key with the sampling distribution. In the next video, we'll take a look at a, a simulation of how this is done.